with you. You are good, dutiful, faithful people, right? It just takes time to get your attention. <laughs> That's okay. That's energy. I love it. Welcome to worship at Zion Lutheran Church. Uh, this is the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. We uh, sometimes, in, in different traditions, they call this ordinary time rather than the Sundays after Pentecost. And the flavor of the lessons and so forth reflect that. We deal with just ordinary stuff, just, um, usually on the Sundays after Pentecost. Um, eating and drinking and joys and struggles and all that real life is about. And so today we continue in that tradition. With that in mind, we are grateful for God who blesses all of that and wonder if there may be additional prayer requests. Stan might have his pen ready. It looks like you do to jot those down. Uh, family of Bart Carcelli. Mm -hmm. World War II. Yes, for Bart Carcelli's family upon his death. Yes. Thank you. Sure. Uh, family of Simon Diefenbaugh. Family of Simon Diefenbaugh, right, who, who died recently, suddenly. Yeah. Is she not on the list? Amy Frank Miller. Amy Frank Miller. She, she is, but okay. absolutely. Thank you. I think we need to say special blessings for teachers and children that are going back to school. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> special blessing for teachers. And go, going back, uh, it seems like earlier every year, doesn't it? That's right. Yeah, thank you. Good. My cousin Cindy. Okay. Yeah, for Cindy. Somebody else and to pray. 
pray for those people that come to get food and, and go, door, go door to door and pray with them on site if we can, rather than just scribbling down the name. You might get more personal connection with people, and it's just nice to have somebody pray with you sure. or you wait in front of you. Sure. Very good. Thank um, you. Amen is right. Thanks for uh, th those people who have a special heart for prayer. Appreciate that so much. Thanks for that encouragement. Any others? Hearing no others, then let us quiet our hearts using this time of prelude. Hear again the words of your baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of our neighbors, using a time of silence for reflection and self-examination. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned. We have hurt our community. We have squandered your blessings. We have hoarded your bounty. 
In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Righteous God, we confess that we have sinned. We have failed to be honest. We have lacked the courage to speak. We have spoken falsely. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us mercy. God is a cup of cold water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You are freed and forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We rise for the hymn 461. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also
pray together the prayer of the day. Glorious God, your generosity waters the world with goodness, and you cover creation with abundance. Awaken in us a hunger for the food that satisfies both body and spirit, and with this food fill all the starving world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We continue with the reading of Scripture. The first reading is from Genesis, chapter 32, verses 22 through 31. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, his 11 children, and crossed the ford at the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything he had. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him, and he passed Peniel, limping because of his heap. Word of life, word of God. The psalm reading is said responsibly. It's Psalm 145. It's found in your bulletin. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up those who are bowed down. You open wide your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. You are near to all who call upon you, and to all who call upon you faithfully. You fulfill the desire of those who hear you. You hear their cry and say You watch over all those who love you, but all the wicked you shall destroy. The second reading is from Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. This is the beginning of a new section in Paul's letter in which he will deal with the place of Israel in God's saving plan. He opens by highlighting how Israel's heritage and legacy include being God's children, having God's covenants, being given God's law, participating in worship of God, and receiving divine promises. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh, 
They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. Word of God, word of life. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Listen for the word of God. Now, when Jesus heard about the beheading of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My daughter Sarah and I have been in a meaningful conversation recently involving the long-standing Christian notion of the hiddenness of God, the hiddenness of God. Among other things, we are chewing on a disturbing yet hopeful prayer that was prayed by the contemplative American Trappist monk Thomas Merton, who prays to God with these words. Your brightness is my darkness, O Lord. I know nothing of you. And by myself, I cannot even imagine how to go about knowing you. If I imagine you, I am mistaken. If I understand you, I am deluded. If I am conscious and certain I know you, I am crazy. The darkness is enough. What, dear friends, do you make of a prayer like that? What kind of faith issues forth in your brightness is my darkness, O Lord, and the darkness is enough? Beloved pastor Eugene Peterson offers a practical response when he says this. Well, it looks like I have to let go of what I expected and enter a mystery. (laughs) Looks like I have to let go of what I expected and enter a mystery. Well, if you are like other modern Christians, you find this a tall order. 
Despite the fact that the scriptures are full of God's people wrestling with mystery and darkness and the hiddenness of God, often with anguished cries like, like, where are you, my God? And how long, O Lord? And, and even in today's gospel lesson, when Jesus received the disturbing news of the beheading of John the Baptist, he withdrew by himself in a boat to a deserted place. The same Jesus who cried in anguish from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Hmm? Even though we have all kinds of evidence from the scriptures about this hiddenness and darkness and mystery and struggle, our declarations and conversations about God usually tend toward what we claim as happy certainties, right? God is good. God is in charge and God means us well. All things work together for good to those who, who love God. God has a plan. God has a good plan for our lives. Jesus is my master and my friend and, and Jesus blesses me and heals me and saves me. My sense is that we prefer to be cheerleaders for God, <laughs> probably because we need to continually assure ourselves. And that's not wrong. Oh no, that's not a bad thing. It is not wrong to acknowledge that God is good. God is good. <laughs> and in today's gospel lesson, it pretty well confirms that Jesus does indeed feed people. Hmm? But cheerleading is little consolation at the times in our lives when our pain is formidable when our pain is overwhelming and, and the God whom we believe to be powerful and loving seems to be absent or silent. Cheerling at this point can seem almost like mockery when our hearts cry, why does God let me hurt like this? Why, is, is God actually capable of helping me? Does God really love me? Is God even there? Well, I think today's Old Testament lesson, telling the story of Jacob wrestling, is instructive here. For you see, when we wrestle with God, when we wrestle with God, then God is neither absent nor silent, but is simply relating to us as a God that we may not expect. You might say that we're wrestling with our notions about God as much as we're wrestling with God's self. Hmm? And wrestling with our expectations of God can be hopeful, even while being unsettling. In a wonderful book I am reading called Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake. It's a book about fungus. You probably aren't interested, but I like it. Um, anyway, it's called Entangled Life. He uh, recounts the experience of his friend, David Abrams, who used to be the house magician at Alice's Restaurant in Massachusetts. Yes, that's the one made famous by the song by Arlo Guthrie. <laughs> he writes this, every night, David passed around the tables, coins walked through his fingers, reappeared exactly where they shouldn't, disappeared again, divided in two, vanished into nothing, one evening, two customers returned to the restaurant shortly after leaving and pulled David aside, looking troubled. When they left the restaurant, they said, the sky had appeared shockingly blue and the clouds large and vivid. Had he put something in their drinks? Well, as the weeks went by, it continued to happen. Customers returned to say that the the traffic seemed louder than it was before, the street lights brighter, the patterns on the sidewalk more fascinating, the rain more refreshing. The magic tricks were changing the way people experienced the world. David explained why he thought this happened. He says, our perceptions work in large part by expectation. Biologically, it takes less cognitive effort to make sense of the world using preconceived images updated with a small amount of new sensory information than to constantly form entirely new perceptions from scratch. It is our preconceptions 
that create the blind spots in which magicians do their work. By attrition, coin tri tricks loosen the grip of our expectations about the way hands and coins work. Eventually, they loosen the grip of our expectations on our perceptions more generally. On leaving the restaurant, the sky looked different because the diners saw the sky as it was there and then, rather than as they expected it to be. Tricked out by our expectations, tricked out of our expectations, we fall back on our senses. What's astonishing is the gulf between what we expect to find and what we find when we actually look. So, mostly, we see what we expect to see, not necessarily what's really there. This is also true for how we see God. Hmm? We all have expectations about who God is and how God should behave. When God doesn't meet our expectations, we wrestle. Jacob wrestles. Jacob won't let go until he gets some satisfaction for his trouble. He asks for a blessing. His blessing comes in the form of a transformation and a wound. He's transformed. His name and therefore his character is changed from Jacob, a name which in Hebrew actually literally means thief, uh, you remember he stole his birthright, uh, uh, Esau's birthright from him. He's changed to Israel, a name which in Hebrew aims to mean chosen. And he is afflicted with a dislocated hip. He limps out into a changed world as a changed man because of his wrestling. But his greater request is denied. He asks for a name. To get somebody's name, to get a name, is to gain a handle on somebody, which is really to gain a little measure of control over somebody. We all know this. If a thief gets your name these days and a few numbers, that thief can exercise some, some control over you by draining your bank account, right? <laughs> Jacob makes the same request we make in one form or another when we respond to our pain by asking, you know, who is this guy? Who is this God who lets me hurt so much? Please tell me your name. Who are you really? Give me a handle on you, O oh God. What kind of God are you that I should, I should put my trust in you? Can I get a handle on you so that maybe, just maybe, I can work to convince you to help me out? But the holy wrestler dodges answering Jacob's question by asking another question. Why is it that you ask my name? Or perhaps more accurately, that holy wrestler diverts Jacob's attention to something that's more important. Perhaps, Jacob, he seems to be saying, you're asking the wrong question. Why are you asking that question? Why are you asking my name? Maybe you're asking the wrong question. A question not unlike the customers at Alice's restaurant who asked David Abrams, did you put something in my drink? Wrong question. <laughs> perhaps a better question is, what am I supposed to be learning from this? What am I supposed to be learning from this? Jacob limps away from his encounter, but he sees things differently. Jacob learns something. Maybe to Jacob, the sky was shockingly blue and the clouds were large and vivid and the rain was more refreshing because he was actually seeing. What did Jacob see? Did you hear what the text said? Jacob declared, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. <laughs> and the sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. That's the way the verse ends. Jacob wrestled with God in the darkness, in the pre-dawn darkness, when the darkness often seems most dark, right? And after doing so, at its appointed time, the sun rose upon him, and he came away, shall we say, enlightened. <laughs> but here's the greater point. Also, in its right time and its right place, the darkness was enough. 
My daughter Sarah said to me, Dad, you can tell our story. We have been very open and public about it. She and her husband Jeremy have been on a painful journey with infertility, which is what prompted our discussion about the hiddenness of God and our growing appreciation of the Thomas Merton prayer. Their deep desire is to be the parents of a child. For quite some time they have been in anguish that this desire remains unfulfilled. Because of this, my daughter Sarah has been wrestling with God in the dark. <laughs> but she told me recently of her possible transformation, her own sense that, that the sun may perhaps one day rise on her as well. She said, my expectation, hmm, my expectation has been that the darkness is something cold and frightening, a cold and frightening bottomless pit. Being in a dark pit of anguish makes me angry and sad and fearful. But now, she said, I am beginning to wonder if I am not rather enclosed in a darkness that is more like a womb, a place that is warm and protective and nurturing and is leading somewhere. My afflicted daughter, still wrestling, oh yeah, and emotionally limping a bit, may also be receiving the first request. Maybe she is crying out, as did Jacob, I will not let you go until you bless me. <laughs> With uh, some kind of trust that blessing could indeed be granted. Sarah may be watching for the dawn and starting to see what is rather than what is expected as she limps toward her daily life, muttering to herself something about the mixed blessing of perhaps seeing the face of God. But I need to be careful here. At this point, dad that I am, I am tempted to start cheerleading. <laughs> Look everyone, take heart, the sun is rising to defeat the darkness. It's a new day filled with promise. God is good, it's all going to work out. But hold on, we're not there yet. We must not get ahead of ourselves. This wrestling story is not over. We must still let go of expectations and enter the mystery and try to see with new eyes what is really happening. Huh? Perhaps we will be blessed to see a womb rather than a pit. But for now, we must let the darkness be enough. In the darkness, let us wrestle alongside Jacob and Sarah and Jesus and trust the God who received the prayer of Brother Thomas for today, the darkness is enough. Thanks be to God. Amen. The hymn is 243. Please rise. <laughs>
Let us say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. You gather your church together by the Holy Spirit. Inspire all the baptized to proclaim your abundant love throughout the world. Guide us in the mission of the gospel through the word and deed. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You cherish your creation from the smallest microbe to the largest mountain. Protect fragile ecosystems. Send favorable weather. Supply food and water to nourish creatures. Raise us up to care for all you have created. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You desire peace and justice in the world. Instill within all political leaders your desire. Support the work of international peace organizations and provide relief for those in war-torn areas. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You comfort those who are hurting. Accompany those who are alone. Heal those who are sick. Provide for all who are hungry or thirst. Console the bereaved. Bring joy to the sorrowful. And attend to all, uh, and attend to all who call on you, especially those on our current prayer list: Earl McKinley, Jack Williams, Peggy Gilbert, Linda Hampton, Marie Benton Nickham, Joanne Batchelor, Nancy Coble, Lois Dowd, Phyllis Working, Darlene Shear. Faith Miller, Joyce O'Brien, John Frieden, John Fairfield, Amy Fry Miller, Jan Root, the family of Bart Criselli, Cindy, Simon Diefenbach family. And Lord, we lift up to you all the teachers and all the students here at the very beginning of the, another school year. Be with them and guide them and keep them safe. And we thank you, Lord, for the blessing of the community meal. We pray and place all and request your blessings on all who, are, who come, both volunteers and those who are arriving. Hear, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You place it within communities of mutual support and love. Reveal your, you to us. Reveal yourself to us in worship, fellowship, and ministry with our neighbors. Provide for feeding ministries and food banks in our area. 
that we share your abundance with all who hunger. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You have placed before us examples of faithful living who have witnessed to your promises throughout time and space. Rouse us by their lives of service and dedication to be your hands and feet in this world. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the, in the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. We say together the offering prayer. God of field and forest, peace in the sky, you are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness to us that the world may be fed with your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, fulfilling the promise of the resurrection. You pour out the fire of your spirit, uniting in one body people of every nation and tongue, and so, with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with the earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join in singing their unending hymn.
blood crash. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you forever in God's grace. Amen. We pray together. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Bless one another. The God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seed, bless, keep, and sustain you now and to the end of the age. Amen. Please rise for the closing hymn 689.
peace, wrestle boldly, believe more boldly. Thanks be to God. Everybody say it. Thanks be to God. And we have the time for the post of the day.